Okay, uh, Dr. John Stackhouse and I were just chatting about you before we got you on the phone. Uh, were your ears burning? No, not a bit. I didn't hear it. Okay, all right. Well, we were all saying nice things about you, um, except all of us have the same... And by the way, when I say all of us, also joining us in studio is uh, Dr. Natalie Evans. Dr. Evans is a professor of philosophy here at University of Guelph. Uh, Dr. Evans, uh, Dr. Ehrman. <laughs> Hi. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Good, thanks. I thought I'd uh, raise the intelligence level oh, of today's boy. show. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we were all wondering this question because everyone, well, anybody that knows you, and we had a listener suggest we get you on our show. Uh, by the way, may I call you Bart? Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, okay. sure. A listener suggested, Bart, that we get you on the show. And so, you know, we got your book and I've been listening to some of your talks. And my personal journey resonates with yours, as does Natalie's. But our question for all of us, including Dr. John Stackhouse, is, dude, who ran over your bike? <laughs> yeah, actually, it didn't happen that way. Okay, all right. No, because this is what I know about your journey. You were a, a raving fundamentalist evangelical Christian, and then you became a liberal Christian, and then you became an agnostic. Fair enough? Yep, fair enough. Um, and, and it wasn't as a result of one sort of, you know, it's funny, when I announced a few years ago that I was no longer an an evangelical certaintist, and I was, you know, maybe a, a reluctant believer struggling with my uh, my my inner skeptic, my inner atheist. Um, people ask me, "Oh, did you did you have a moral failing?" Yes, <laughs> right. And I, I said, lots of those. I said, "I've had lots of those." That's got nothing to do with this one right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, people do want to know what happened to you. You know, and. Uh, it it's never seems to be a satisfying answer to anybody that you looked around the world and thought about it for a while and came to this realization. Hmm. Yeah. Do you, who has given you the most amount of grief? I'm sure John MacArthur has already egged your house. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is I get uh, the, the most grief I get are from two uh, polar opposite sides. So uh, very conservative evangelicals get really uh, ticked off at me. But the other people get ticked off at me are the uh, the atheist mythicists. Right. Uh, I get that. They're, they're, they're equally vitriolic. Yeah, yeah. You know, we it's interesting. We reached out to uh, to Richard Dawkins uh, for the show today, and uh, normally I'll hear back from from someone. Didn't get nothing. <laughs> Not a, and you're a, surprised. No, no. Because I listen. I hear back from everybody, whether yeah. it's James Brown's people or Alice Cooper's people or yeah. you know b b big people that are doing a heck of a lot more than Dawkins. And I would have thought that. Well, you know what? I mean, he may have just sort of said. I just don't want to have this he's discussion again. Or, or he's like, yeah, it's a long weekend <laughs> yeah. over there, yeah. So we're glad you've joined us, Dr. Ehrman. The problem of suffering. You know, there was a guy who was buddies with Billy Graham who wrote a book, uh, uh, The End of Religion, who uh, that was his big thing, the uh, the problem of suffering. But in my own struggles, Dr. Ehrman, I, I don't I don't see that. I, I mean, I guess I get it on the grand scale, but when somebody individually suffers... I, I just go, well, that, that's life. Come on. We're North Americans, and we, so we still get surprised that anybody should suffer at all. But when I came out of the children's exhibit at the Holocaust Memorial in, in Jerusalem and wept for about a half an hour and cussed yeah. out God for half an hour, that's where I have a problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, no, obviously, you know, if you've got an extra neighbor who's got a problem, that's one thing. But if you have uh, millions of people either dying in a holocaust or in uh because of starvation uh yeah you've got a bigger problem on your hands so uh, being an agnostic scholar of religion do you think that brings more street cred <laughs> uh, not necessarily but uh it, it does mean that i don't accept uh, standard answers just because they're the standard answers when it comes to religion uh, there, there aren't too many of us. Uh, there, there actually are a lot. I would say there are a lot of agnostic scholars of religion, but there are not a lot of agnostic scholars of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, there are just about as many Bible scholars in uh, North America as there are other religion scholars. Um, but most of the agnostics are doing the other religions. That makes sense. You know, I, I, I'm sorry to ask you the question you always get asked, or, you know, I guess in a roundabout way we're going to have this discussion about agnostic versus atheist, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I joked with Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller uh, when I said to him, okay, so an agnostic is someone that's not sure, and an atheist is someone who's really not sure and is arrogant about it. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that, you know, when I became an agnostic, I had no idea that that both agnostics and atheists were so militant about their own terms. 
And so uh, you're right. Uh, uh, agnostics think that atheists are just arrogant agnostics, and atheists think that ar- agnostics are simply uh, wimpy atheists. Yeah. But but the reality is, I I think these two terms uh, mean something different. They refer to something different. Mm-hmm. I think agnosticism is actually a statement about epistemology, about what you know, uh, and you know, do you do you know whether there's a superior divine being in the universe? And you know, my my view is no. I mean, how would I know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know. So, but atheism isn't a question about what you know. It's about a question. It's a question about what you believe. Yeah. Uh, do you, Do you believe in a, in, for example, the God of the Bible, a, a God who intervenes in this world and answers prayer and helps out those who need it? And my answer is no. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. So I I actually consider myself to be both an agnostic and an atheist. Oh, oh you just, come on! You can't do that. That's just <laughs> so. No, you, you, uh, I I can if you if you heard what I was just saying. Okay, Agnosticism all right. is about what you know, and atheism is about what you believe. So they're not two degrees of the same thing. Right. They're two different kinds of things. Some um, people are uh, who know your story know that you dragged your family into the evangelical scene, and then you left them behind, like Kirk Cameron did in that movie. Um, <laughs> are they? I mean, I'm going through you know kind of a similar deal. And I've sort of left family behind on this whole uh, spiritual journey, and, and and they're sort of still where I was. And um, boy, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, there's a part of me that doesn't like that. Are yeah, you... well, it's not pleasant. I mean, I mean, you know, it's you know, having ha- being in a believing community isn't just about you know having certain propositional ideas in your head. It's about uh, having social networks and. Uh, family and friends, and and when you leave the faith, you leave all of that behind, and it obviously creates a void that either remains a void or it gets filled in some other ways. And it's hard to fill that with other academics, let me tell you. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not not a good idea to try that. No, yeah. no it's not. Uh, this is personal, and you tell me uh, if you don't want to go there or not. Uh, be straight up with me, if you, you know, please. Your journey has it had an impact on on your relationship with your wife? Uh, no, because it happened before I met her. So this is my second marriage. Um, my wife is actually a Christian, but she's not a conservative evangelical Christian. She's a very liberal, uh, open-minded Episcopalian who thinks religion is more about worship and liturgy than it is about propositional mm-hmm. truth. And so she doesn't really care much, you know, what I be- personally believe. So your whole journey was basically this inevitability thing. That, bottom line, you just couldn't believe anymore because of your doubt. I couldn't believe it anymore because I, you know, I had thought that there was a God who was active in the world and who uh, would answer prayer and would help people when they were in need. And I looked around the world and I realized, in fact, it's not true. And so, um, but you chucked the whole baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Well, I mean, if God doesn't exist, that that is the baby and the bathroom. Yeah, no, no, you're di- no, because you, what you said earlier was that he didn't interact. So he, no, maybe... I don't believe he exists. I think that if he existed, that he, uh, in other words, there might be some other kind of divine being in the universe, but there certainly is not one who helps people who are in need. Like a personal I mean, God, right? Like a personalized Right, but can you not still believe in a God who spun it and split, and then you see him when you're dead? You could if you wanted to, sure. But that's uh, not for you. Well, I just, I mean, why, would, why, what would make you want to believe that? Yeah, it seems almost like it's just, then it makes it irrelevant to anything that you do. Or, But that's because the three of us grew up with the tribal conditioning that says God is interactive in our lives each and every day. And there is a whole subset of, of the Christian tribe that doesn't believe that. They do believe, that's you right. know, cessationists or whatever. They believe that God, okay, exists, but he spun it and split. He no longer well, interacts the way that he did in biblical times. But then how does it affect your life? Like, well, how does it impact your life? Well, it's about living by the code. What it's code? about, uh, well, the red letters, for example. Like, Tony Campolo gets up my nose all, you know, whenever we talk. He's actually up in this neck of the woods again, him and his giant ear hair. And he says to me, what do you believe, Marshall? What do you believe? And I said, look, I'm, I think I'm a red letter agnostic theist. Is that just, yeah. is that weird? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> I mean, you know, the you know, I just think that if you believe something, you ought to have a reason for believing it. Yeah. And so, and so, just believing it because you know you're trying to hold on to some kind of remnant of something that you used to have doesn't make sense to me. All right, before we talk about your book, because this is why you're on the show today to talk about your book, can I just have a free counseling session with you? For a second? <laughs> sure. free. I thought that's what we were doing. Okay. Yes, yeah, uh, pretty much. <laughs> what would you What would you call me? How would you 
ask me something or a few questions to try to figure out what I believe and what I am, because I think that what I believe is what I am. Is that a mistake? Is that a poor presupposition? Yes. Uh, Ooh, listen to uh, Natalie uh, Evans, Dr. Philosophy over here. Mm, yeah. So, well, I mean, it sounds like you're a deist. So, um, you know, who believes in the, the ethical teachings of Judeo-Christian religion? And the difference between a deist and a theist, for those listening who don't know. <laughs> right. Well, a deist is someone who, who is, as you described, who thinks that God started the world and set it off ticking and then went off to do other things, so that there's a God, he's just not active in the world. So a theist is somebody who believes that God is still active in the world. See, my problem is I, every time I – I went through years of this on the show here, having all sorts of people from around the world call in with their tangible, interactive encounters with God stories, and they were jokes. They were horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It, they were – I mean, I hate to summarize it like this, but they were all sort of, I prayed for a parking spot, and there was a parking spot stories. <laughs> it's like the I mean, story of my life with my family. Well, it's completely infuriating because, you know, God answers their prayer for a parking lot, but, uh, you know, every – Every um, five seconds, a child dies of starvation in the world. And so yeah. God cares about your parking lot, but he doesn't care about that child who just starved to death. Exactly. Man. See, I've, I don't know what I am anymore. And it's <laughs> very confusing. I kind of like it because I'm, of course, a product of my generation who hates labels. Um, but at the same time, it's really frustrating when you go through customs and they question you. <laughs> <laughs> Because I just don't know how to answer it anymore. I wanted to strip away, uh, uh, Bart, the tribal conditioning that I had to find out if I, if what I believed was really what I believed. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wasn't just leaning on, well, just read your Bible more, just go to church, just listen to Stephen Curtis Chapman. Um, and it doesn't, I don't know, it's not It's not flying anymore. What are you, what's going yeah. on with you over there? Natalie's giving me these strange looks. <laughs> I've got all these funny looks going on. Yeah, I know. No, but it's just, well, it's interesting because I find, like, my family, like, you know, my parents and, well, my sister's married to a minister. I mean, like, my family is still very religious. Sure. Um, and me being, like, a philosophy major is a bit of a, you know, well. I conundrum? Mean, well, yeah, it's a bit of a conundrum to put it lightly, but yeah. but it's it's that there's a disconnect. Like, we, I find it, the, it becomes... A situation where we can't discuss things like they are off topic mm-hmm. because yeah. because there's no budging like I'm always curious I want to ask well have you thought about all sides that's philosophy right sure. like, have you considered all arguments and all sides of the coin and and they're not comfortable with the fact that for me I, again like I, I'm I would probably put myself in say I'm agnostic because I'm really it's like I can you be an agnostic theist uh, I'm definitely not a theist no you're not <laughs> oh no I mean deist. sorry idea. deist can you be an agnostic deist well, you could deist, be, but right? if you're a deist, you're saying that there is a God. Yeah. Agnostic, you're just not. Oh, I was really... right the first time. An agnostic theist. No, 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 because then you're saying there's a God who's active. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Okay, so okay. You could be a theist yeah. saying God is active. You could right. be a deist if God is not active. You'd be an agnostic saying you just don't know. You just don't know. Because there's I no just, way to find out, right? I, mean, I just want to belong. <laughs> You can belong but, to but a I group think, of agnostics. Well, yeah, and I also think, like I said before, like I think you can choose to believe in something if if you really if that's what makes you comfortable and you feel better about that. Then yeah. I think, like for me, I can't quite bring myself to do that because I feel like I'm not being sincere, right? Exactly, yeah. I so, totally get that. Yeah. yeah, but then is there not a little piety in that? You know, taking yourself so seriously that you're not, you know, I can't believe in anything because uh, you know I just I, I might be fooling myself. I don't know. I think I see it as honesty. Yeah, um, I think you just have to be honest with yourself. If you don't really believe it, then I think you just have to come to grips with it and say, I don't believe it anymore. Okay. Uh, on the phone with Dr. Bart Ehrman, and he is um, a fascinating gentleman. I've actually wanted to have you on the show for quite a while now. Uh, my apologies for taking so long to get to you. He is a master explainer of Christian history, and he tackles the question of how a Jewish preacher from a rural backwater you know, hood uh, executed for crimes against the state, came to be viewed as God. Um, well, how did it happen? I mean, sum it up for us. <laughs> yes, well, that's what the book's about. Okay, I know, well. I'm going to say, it's amazing. I Well, I just had the copy handed to me, but it's a really... I'm, I want to take this home with me. Can I take this Yes, home you can. Me? Thank you. So what is the number one thing you've received the most heat for in this book? Um, well, pro- I mean, from from conservative evangelicals, I think the thing that uh, they don't like the most is that I uh, I argue that Jesus did not consider himself to be God, 
and didn't call himself God, uh, and that during his lifetime his disciples didn't think he was God, but that, that's something that, that developed after his life. And the reason evangelicals get upset with that is because in the Gospel of John, our, the last of our Gospels, uh, Jesus does clear, declare that he's a divine mm-hmm. being who's come from heaven. And so what I do, what I do in the book is, as I sketch out why why critical scholars for a very long time have thought that these statements in the Gospel of John, where Jesus calls himself God, are not historical statements, but they're theological statements put on Jesus' lips by the author of the fourth Gospel. Well, bottom line is, if you think that the the canon of scriptures that has been put together is not the inerrant word of God, then you get to then dig into things with a different set of glasses on. And so when all of the scriptures that would suggest that Jesus said, I am God, uh, you just look at those and go, yeah, no, not true. Well, that's kind of it. I mean, the thing the thing worth noting is that he only does that in one of the four Gospels, So, and it's the last Gospel to be written. Mm. And so one of the questions is, if Jesus really was going around calling himself God, how is it that Matthew, Mark, and Luke never get around to mentioning that part? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's like they, they just didn't think that was important enough to point out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oops. <laughs> so so they, they are the earliest Gospels, and so in none of the early Gospels did Jesus say anything like that at all. It's only in our latest Gospel that Jesus says that, and I think that that's, that's significant because it shows probably what's happened is that theological understandings of Jesus have developed by the time the Gospel of John was written, and these things then are put on his lips. Of all the guys out there that you respect on the other side, (laughs) the dark side, uh, for example, Craig Evans, I mean, are there others that would argue against you whose views you actually respect and appreciate? Um. Well, there you know there are a lot of good, very good evangelical scholars out there who are who are good scholars uh, with whom I I disagree. I mean, um, you know, I, I had a two-hour radio debate on this topic with uh, a fellow who teaches at, University, at Cambridge University in, in England, a guy named Sa- Simon Gathercole. He's a very smart fellow, and we you know we simply just disagree on major issues. Um, so there are yeah no there's certainly people out there who are who are bona fide scholars. When was the last time one of those people rocked your world with some kind of point where you just sat back and went, hmm? And, and here's, here's my comparison, and this is probably a poor comparison, but uh, you remember the recent debate that was labeled uh, Ham on Nye? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so Ken Ham and Bill Nye had the, had the big creation debate. and yes. uh, No, whatever, it was sensationalistic. And really, the people that won were the, uh, was the Ken Ham gang and the, and the museum and the creationists. They won just simply by getting Bill Nye to agree to come to this thing. Uh, but the, the the summarizing statement at the end was uh, basically, what would it take for you to believe the other person's you know side? Yes. And and um, uh, Bill Nye said evidence, yes. and Ken Ham said nothing. Yes. And that was the in essence the entire debate right there. That kind of just shows where everything is at. And so I I guess in a, in a just a jerk radio guy kind of way, Bart. I'm trying to I'm trying to ask you if. Do you still perceive yourself as teachable? Oh yeah, no, I change my mind about things all the time. I mean, well, then why time. should we trust what you're what you're writing <laughs> now? Well, you mean you'd rather trust somebody who is so intransigent that they'd never <laughs> look at evidence? Oh, that was a good point. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, though. But. So uh, I change my mind about some things in the book that I that are rather significant. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, you, you shouldn't be trusting what somebody says anyway. You ought to be looking at the evidence yeah. they deduce to see whether it's convincing But, or Bart, not. we do not have time. You know, this is your deal. You're paid to read and learn and, and write. Uh, but the rest of us have a life. <laughs> we just, we don't have time to do yeah, all this see, stuff and look should, into but it. But we should. This is why like, we should all be critical thinkers. I mean, we can't all claim just to be, you know, dumb. I mean, we've got to be critical thinkers. So even if we're not historians in this field, we can still read it with a critical eye, right? Yeah. And, right. and find you know, areas book, where we have questions and things like that. Absolutely. I mean, when my book came out, there was a, there was a, a counter book that came out the same week. Uh, so my book is called How Jesus Became God, mm-hmm. and the counter book is called How God Became Jesus. Uh-huh. <laughs> and wow. uh, they, had, they had seen my manuscript and wrote a response to it. Um, it was five evangelical Christian scholars, including Craig Evans and Simon Gathercole and three others. And, you know, if people have any questions about who's got the better position, all they have to do is read both 
both books and yeah. see who's got the better position. Wow, that's handy. I like that. That's, <laughs> very, that's very well done. Uh, Natalie, will you do that? Because you're a reader of things. Yeah, no, I'd love to read both. I need to get the other book. You know, I really appreciate Craig Evans. Uh, he and I worked on a project together where I was in Israel uh, for a month uh, doing a television show called Journey to Christmas. And it was a story of five travelers who uh, had never been to Israel before. And we followed the trail that Mary and Joseph would have taken, et cetera, et cetera. And he was sort of one of the scholars that added his uh, brilliance to the to the documentary reality show. And um, and I I do appreciate you see you know Marshall McLuhan really had it right where the the uh, the meeting is the message right I mean it's it really is about the pro- the approach if you were such an arrogant schmuck Bart I just couldn't I just couldn't whatever you said was not, would not be palatable to me and it's the same with yeah. Craig I find I find Craig's approach uh, quite palatable as well yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for not being a jerk is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, listen, folks, uh, you, you've got to know more about this man in this book uh, because that's really, uh, you know, I guess the, one of the foundational building blocks of this show is, you know, just because I'm on this journey doesn't mean you are. And so for you to change the channel because I'm spouting stuff that doesn't make sense to you is ridiculous. Uh, do the research yourself. Think about things and, uh, and process stuff. The, uh, the spoon-fed... Uh, dummy down syndrome that uh, was just like the people that followed Charles Manson. I mean, is that what you want to be like? Come on. So Dr. Bart Ehrman is who we've been chatting with, New York Times bestselling author of How Jesus Became God. His website is on our website. You can find it, but you can also go to Bart D. Ehrman. What's the D stand for? I'd like to know what that is. Uh, Denton. Oh, that's quite, uh, uh, I don't know, smart sounding. Um <laughs> Uh, you've got some great, great material, and I would encourage everyone to uh, to get this book. It would it really would help people, I think, wake up to a few uh, points that um, the spoon fed tribe has has maybe wrecked us on a little bit. So, thank you for your time, Bart. I really do appreciate it. That's my pleasure. All right, you take care. Bye bye, Bart Emmerich on the Drew Marshall Show. Bye.